Oh, man. Um, I, I love those words, your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after me. You know, there's a lot that is so profoundly beautiful and transformational about being at a camp like this. Um, I, I think I told you on Monday, maybe I didn't tell you, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, I spent like 10 years, the first 10 years of my uh, ministry, local church ministry life, um, serving students, uh, high school, middle school, and then eventually college students. And so every year uh, in the winter and in, in the summer, um, we would go on camp trips. And sometimes, uh, sometimes we would have the camp here at Mount Hermon. Um, sometimes we would go to other places. Uh, a few summers we rented a bunch of houseboats on Lake Shasta and just, you know, um, wakeboarded all week and tubed. And, but every summer I would, every summer and winter I would take our students on these trips and we would have experiences like this where things would, you know, the pace of life would slow down and our hearts and our minds would get centered on um, stuff that just felt... Uh, spiritual and Jesus-centered in ways that uh, we didn't experience sort of away from the camp environment. And then there was this really cynical trend, right? And some of you, many of you are familiar with the term camp high. And so our students would come back and then a bunch of cynics would tell them, well, what you experience is just like the camp high. And um, sometimes even as adults, as parents and grandparents and just, you know, young adults and young professionals, we come to places like this and that same cynicism sort of rears its ugly head. We're on the back end of our week together now. This is Thursday. We've only got today, tomorrow, and then Saturday morning, we're off. We're back down the mountain to the reality of our lives. And there will be the lies of the enemy that whisper to you cynicism. There will be the lies of the enemy that whisper to you, well, all of that stuff was just your Mount Hermon camp high. This is reality. The struggle of life, the pain, the hardship, the hopelessness, the fact that you're just back in the same old rut you were in the week before you went to Mount Hermon, that's reality. You just paid a little money to have six days of Camp High, good for you, now get back to what's really true. And as, um, not as a pastor or anything like that, just as a follower of Jesus, I just want to tell you, this is something I tell people quite a bit actually. This is reality. Like the stuff you feel and think as Pastor Kurt gives us so much to chew on in the evenings. I'm still thinking about this morning. I'm still thinking about the concept like it's not me versus you. It's us versus the problem. You know, like that type of stuff based and born out of the scriptures the life and teachings of Jesus our Savior, that's reality. The emotions you feel, the stuff you can't even name, that's reality. And the challenge before us is not how do I get back to Mount Hermon next year? How do I just survive the reality of my life for the next 300 something days until I can get back here and just kind of get a breather? The challenge is, how do I tap into the reality I have tapped into in this beautiful place 365 days out of the year? Without the band, without the scenery, without everybody here in this giant room, without, you know, a stellar staff cooking all our meals for us. Like, without any of that, how do I still continue to tap into the thing that is most real, which is Jesus and his love for us? I love that line. Again, I love that line. Your goodness is running after me. Again, you're going to go back down this mountain in a couple of days. And it's going to feel like you are trekking back into reality. And there, again, the enemy is going to whisper this lie of cynicism toward you. That the goodness of God stays here on this mountain. And you're just heading back to your regular old life. But the truth is, the goodness of God is running after you. And you know what's crazy? He's faster than you. 
Yesterday, uh, I took the kids down, oh, no, two days ago, I took the, the kids, my little kids, down to the pool. And my four-year-old, we took kind of like, not the stairs, but the, the back road that leads to um, where day camp is, you know, that little trail. We took that trail back up. And my son, who's, who's basically, he's four now, he's like, Daddy, chase me. Daddy, chase me. So I'm like, bro, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> On this trail, you can fall and die. And, but before I can say that to him, he just goes off running. But he wants me to chase him. So... He's running up this narrow trail. You guys have been on this trail. He's running up this narrow trail with imminent death on his left. And instead of looking where he's going, he's looking back at me to see if daddy's chasing him. And he's having a great time. I'm thinking to myself, well, there he goes, <laughs> right into the arms of the Lord. So what do I do? What do I do as a loving father? I run after him, and thankfully, I'm faster than him. God is faster than you. As much danger and peril and treachery lies before you, God is faster than you, and he's running after you. It doesn't matter how far down this mountain you go, his goodness, his love, his grace, is running after you, and he will catch you. The last couple of mornings, uh, we've been asking these questions that Jesus asks of us. The first question was, who do you say I am? Do you really believe that Jesus is who he says that he is? And I asked you to ponder that throughout the day. A couple of mornings ago, we explored the, the idea of doubt. When Jesus asks Peter as he sinks into the water, why did you doubt? But remember, he did not ask him that question until he rescued him from drowning. The doubt does not keep Jesus away from us, but in his love he draws near to us, saves us and rescues us in spite of our doubts and our uncertainties. And today uh, we're going to explore a different question. And to set it up, I want to share with you something that's true in my life that I think is true in many of our lives. And it's this constant struggle I feel between two very different ideas. These are the two ideas. One, I can do it. I can do it. Like, uh, I don't know how many basketball fans we have here. I'm like a hoop head. I'm a basketball junkie. Golden State Warriors fan, so it is a very good time in my life right now. And, uh, but I don't know if you guys remember, like in the late 2000s, the Boston Celtics, who we just destroyed in the NBA Finals, <laughs> praise the Lord. But in the late 2000s, the Boston Celtics got a player named Kevin Garnett, who's like an incredible Hall of Fame player. They win an NBA title, Kevin Garnett's first NBA title. They're interviewing him post-game, and there's this iconic scene where Kevin Garnett, who's like seven feet tall, he just is like, how do you feel, KG? And he like, doesn't know what to say, and he just screams, anything is possible. Have you guys seen that clip? It's like so awesome. Sometimes in my life, I feel like that. It's like anything is possible, I can do anything, which is a lie. That's like a modern, western, very American lie. Hey, I can do anything. No, you can't. I can't either. Now, it's not to say we shouldn't tell our children, like, work hard, right, and do your absolute best. Yes, of course. Of course. But, like, literally anything is possible? No, it's not. When I was a kid, going back to basketball, Every single morning I'd wake up and I would dribble a tennis ball in my house because I was told that that was one of the best ways to work on your ball handling skills in basketball because when I was in middle school, I had a dream that I would be an NBA basketball player. And at the time, in eighth grade, I was 5'7". And now, 30 years later, I am still 5'7". So as a 12-year-old being 5'7", I was like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to grow to 6'6". I got skills. 
I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to play in the NBA. And then I just stopped growing. And I, I, I didn't stop growing. I just started growing sideways, not vertically. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is a problem. I'm growing the wrong direction for the NBA. It's not possible. Like, not any, anything is not possible. I can't play in the NBA. I'm too short. I'm not skilled enough. I'm not fast enough. On and on and on. But I still vacillate between that's one of the ideas. Anything is possible. I can do it. If I put my mind to it, I can do it. On my own, don't need help. And then sometimes I go to the other extreme where it's like it's totally hopeless. I have... Nothing, nothing's going to get better. You know, Pastor Kurt talked a lot about COVID and a lot about our division. And I think a lot of our division was born out of deep down inside just an intrinsic hopelessness. We like looked deep inside and we felt like this morbid sort of nothing's going to get better. It's all over. Life as I knew it is over. And so this anger had to go somewhere. And so we directed it at others. Mask, no mask, all that stuff, vaccine, anti-vax, all that stuff. It's just like deep down, I think it was just this deep, dark hopelessness that needed to express itself. And it ended up expressing itself and continues to do so in really destructive ways. So I vacillate between these two often. I can do anything or it's hopeless. I can't do anything. No one can do anything. Anybody relate? In the past seven years alone, there has been a, in America, there has been a 300, 300% increase in the sale of self-help books. That's in the past seven years. Now, here's what's really fascinating. Even before those seven years, self-help books were already the best-selling books in America. They were already the books that sold the most. In fact, go to any bookstore, like... Uh, you know, Amazon has brick and mortars now. You might be able to find like your local bookstore or like one of the very few Barnes and Noble brick and mortar bookstores that are around. The largest section of any major bookstore is what? The self-help section. They are by far the most popular books in the country and even more so today. Increased by 300% in just the last seven years. This is the I can do anything and I can do it myself sort of perspective. Some of the best-selling self-help books, and these aren't actually necessarily even bad. I'm not critiquing them. I'm just telling you this is the culture we live in. Let me read you some of the best-selling self-help books, uh, their titles in the last seven years. Find Your Path, Designing Your Destiny, The Guide to Greatness. I mean, these sound awesome, right? No wonder they sell so well. Right? Like, we all want that. I want to find my path. Yes, I would love to design my destiny. And absolutely, I want to be great. <laughs> right? It just taps into all of the stuff that's in our flesh. But at the same time, in the past two years, nearly 70% of Americans admit to having experienced at least some level of anxiety and depression. In the past year, over half of Californians who have been surveyed, 54% of Californians, admit to feeling hopeless. What's happening? 300% increase in the sale of self-help books. We're like all in. It's like, oh yeah, I can do it. Find my path. Design my destiny. Become great. I'm in. I could do it myself. Put my mind to it, plug away, work hard, and I can do it myself. And at the same time, increasingly so, we feel hopeless, and depressed, and anxious, like all hope is lost. So it's not just me, and it's not just you. Most people, most people feel this strange vacillation between these two extremes. I can do anything. Or it's hopeless. All hope is lost. Sometimes we vacillate between these two extremes in the same day or in the same conversation, you know? So the question is how do we get well? How do we get well? 
How do we stop living torn between these two extremes and not find a healthy middle, but transcend the extremes and live the sort of life God has called us to live? John chapter 5. There's this story. It says this. Now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, which in Aramaic, Aramaic was the spoken language in Jesus' time, in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid, so he's paralyzed, he can't move, for 38 years. 38 years he hasn't moved. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he, Jesus, asked him, the paralyzed man, do you want to get well? That is the question today that Jesus asks us. Do you want to get well? And then listen to the man's fascinating response. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. What a weird answer. Jesus says to this man, hey, do you want to get well? I mean, the answer is obvious, right? Is the, the man is lying next to a pool where people believe there was healing. It says a great number of people used to lie here. And it's because these people believe, we'll talk more about this in a moment, these people believe they could be healed in these waters for some reason. So the answer is obvious. Obviously, the man wants to get well. But Jesus asks him the question anyways, do you want to get well? And yet the man, oddly enough, instead of just emphatically saying, yes, please, what will it take? He says, well, I, I can't get into the pool. What? what? It's like I, I try to get into the pool, but other people get into the pool before me. What? What sort of answer is that? Let me show you a picture of the ruins of the Bethesda pool. This is the actual pool. Um, is Pastor Kurt in here? Kurt, are you in here? He's, he's not here. He's been to Israel so many times, I'm wondering if he's actually, he's probably been here. Has anybody been here? Oh, you have. You've seen it. Okay, I want to ask you a question, because I've never been. Um, is, it, is it huge? It, it looks pretty much like that, right? Okay, here's what you need to know. These sorts of public pools in the ancient Greco-Roman world were really common. They were very common. And they were not, pool like our pool here at Mount Hermon is awesome. My kids would live there all day if they could. It's awesome, right? But it's not that sort of pool. Like in the shallow end of the pool here at Mount Hermon, I could sit on my butt and just still, you know, like have my head above water, right? These pools at minimum, typically these public pools, at minimum were 20 feet deep. The pool at Bethesda is about 40 feet deep. It's really, really deep. And most of these pools are the size of a football field. They're huge, right? Now, they're not shaped like a football field, but if you just add the square footage or yardage, it's like about the size of a These are giant public pools, which makes the man's response even stranger. Well, I, other people go into the pool before me. What does that matter, dude? The pool is huge. That would be like if I took my kids to the pool here, here at Mount Hermon, and I was like, let's jump in. And then they're like, no, there's other kids in there. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, dude, it's a pool. <laughs> you know, like, it's, what a weird answer. What is he talking about here? Here's the thing. Public pools in the ancient world, they were not only common as like literal pools where people could come and cool down from the heat of the sun or bathe. Sometimes when people would, would bathe, which is kind of gross, but whatever. And um, they were also really com common as uh, healing shrines. And this particular pool in Bethesda was famously known as a 
pagan healing shrine. In fact, there is strong evidence that at the time of Jesus, the Bethesda pool was a pagan healing shrine dedicated to an ancient god called Eshmun. And Eshmun was an ancient Semitic god who was the god of healing. This is why in the story it tells us that at the Bethesda pool, there were tons of disabled people, sick people who needed healing. That's not random. They're there because there is a common pagan belief at the time that these waters had healing properties. Now, here's what's really interesting. Uh, most of you are looking at the verses as I put them up on the screen. But if you have your Bibles, depending on the translation, just open your Bible to John chapter 5. Open your Bible. And I want you to go to verse 3. And I, you don't need to read it. Just find the number, the verse number, verse 3. John 5, go to verse 3. Now, depending, some of your translations uh, will have it, but many of your translations Go to verse 3, and I want you to take a look. What's the next verse after verse 3? All the answers should be 4, logically. But for how many of you in your Bibles is there no verse 4 in John chapter 5? Look at the hands. What is happening? Some of you are questioning your faith right now. You're like, oh my gosh. What if verse 4 says the entire Bible is a lie? You know, like, they're like, what? <laughs> like, you're freaking out right now. Where is verse 4? What happened? Does anybody have a Bible in which they have verse 4? Okay, you have verse 4? Could you, um, is this mic on? Are one of these mics on? This one? Okay. Could you read verse 4 for the rest of us who don't have verse 4? For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. Oh my goodness, you guys. What the heck? Right? What the heck? Now we're all freaking out. You, you seriously are like, you're questioning your faith. You're like, what is the Bible? Why did they pull that out? What is going on? Everybody relax. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Jesus is still king of the world. He resurrected all that. Verse 4 was most scholars, not all, but most scholars agree that John chapter 5 verse 4 was probably added by a later scribe. Here's something you need to understand about the Bible. The original manuscripts, remember, this is like before, way before the printing press, right? It's like 1,500 years before the printing press or whatever. To um, make copies of these books, what would people have to do? Scribes would have to copy the text, right? Literally, by hand, manually copy the text. And there is strong belief amongst most biblical scholarship that John chapter 5 verse 4 was not in the original manuscript, like the, the very original manuscript of the Gospel of John, but rather was added by a scribe later to try to explain what is happening in this story. Because the verse actually explains what's happening in the story a little bit, right? It actually explains this, the invalid's weird response. Like, okay, again, going back, when the invalid says, when Jesus says, do you want to get well? And the invalid says, well, sir, when the waters are stirred, I can't get into the water. No one helps me and other people get in there first. That response made no sense. But when you read John 5 verse 4, which was added later, they think, it makes a little more sense, does it not? It's like, oh, I see what the invalid man is saying. He believes that these waters get stirred by an angel of God, and whoever steps first into the waters, that person gets healing. And so the man is frustrated because for 38 years, he's an invalid, and he's been waiting. He's just staring at that water. It's like glass, and then it gets stirred up. He's like, now's my time, and then somebody else. For 38 years, he's just been waiting, right? It's like the waters are stirred. Someone help me, and then someone else gets in first. I mean, think about how frustrated you would be. 
it makes sense that the man would respond this way. This man is hopeless. You know what's really interesting? There he is by the water. What? Like there he is, lying by the water. This man has become, he, this man has lost so much hope that he literally cannot even compel himself to move on. He simply relegates himself to the torture of a lying next to what he believes is healing, but knowing he'll never receive the healing. And some of us show up to church this way. You just like load the car, get ready, all the craziness of kids and whatever, and then you go to church. But you've been going through that motion so long that you're just hopeless. Here we go. We just sing a few more songs. The pastor is going to talk, and 35 minutes later, I'll get up, grab a donut on my way out, and get back to my life. Some of us are the invalid man. We just lay next to healing, believing healing will never come. We just like show up over and over again because I guess that's just what you do. But you don't actually believe. Jesus is asking you, do you want to get well? And you say to Jesus, well, <laughs> I can't ever get in there. I can never get into the healing water, so what's the point? And yet here you are, laying next to the healing waters. It's really interesting. This man, this man believes that he has to do it himself somehow, some way. That he has to drag himself into that water. Self-help. Like, I have to do it. But he's hopeless because he can't. He believes that healing is about self-help, but it's sort of hopeless. Because he knows he can't really help himself. This is a way of looking at God like one of those claw games at the arcade. Every time I go to, like, there's this pizza place next to our house that my family loves, and they have the claw game there. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? A bunch of stuffed animals that are just staring at you from the glass. They're like, take me home, <laughs> you know? It's like, please, I'm afraid. I'm lonely in this little glass uh, prison. And my kids, every time they go with me to pick up the pizza, they're like, daddy, I want a stuffed animal. And whenever my wife is there, you know, because <laughs> Jenny's like, you know, she's, she's like a wise, normal human being. She's like, no, we're not wasting a dollar on that stupid claw game. But anytime I take my kids and dads, like, there's a bunch of dads in here that are total studs. You're like firefighters and police officers and, you know, like in the military. But I see you with your daughters. And you're like, anything you want, baby. <laughs> you know, that happens to me too. That happens to me too. So I go to pick up pizza and there's the claw game, I know for sure I'm going to lose these four quarters. My daughter is like, Daddy, give me that stuffed panda bear or whatever. I'm like, anything for you. So I like put in the four quarters and what happens every single time? I'm like trying to do it. And then my little son is like, let me do it. You know, I'm like, get away. Right, I'm trying to do the thing and then I finally like, I think it's the claw is right where it needs to be and I press the button and, it, and these things are designed to, to tease you. Like it always drops down and always like, like the claw clutches the head of the panda bear. My daughter's just so excited. She's like, you did it, daddy. You're the dad of the year. You know, you're changing my life. And then the claw goes and the panda's going up. And then it starts, it starts falling. I'm like, no, 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 no. And then the claw gets just like one of the ear of the panda. And it's going, it's like halfway up. And, and like my daughter's like, she's like, I think you're the dad of the year. And then it drops. And then she's like, you've ruined my life. I hate you forever. <laughs> and that happens every single time. And that's so often how we think healing works with God. Like we think it's self-help. Like I have to do it. Like God is behind a glass case with healing and miracle after healing and miracle just waiting for you. And if you just pray the right prayer, and if you sort of like do the right Christian things, 
And then get that claw right where it needs to be. And you press that button at the exact, at the exact right moment in the right place. It drops down and God is like, here is an answer to your prayer. Here is the healing you need. Here is the restoration for your family. Here is the flourishing of finances and business and work. Here is the, the, the bending of that broken relationship. Here is wholeness for that deep, dark thing inside of you that is just eating away at you. Here it is. And we're like, oh, thank you, Lord. And then it just drops from our clutches. And then we grow cynical. And then we find ourselves 38 years later, like the invalid, just with our head up against the glass case, doing nothing, staring at the possibility of a new life, but cynicism overtaking us, choking possibility out of us. We're like, well, that'll never be me. I'll never get that. John is this um, incredibly brilliant writer. And he actually uses the theme of water over and over again in his gospel. And if you go to John chapter 2, that's where you read the story of Jesus turning uh, water into wine. You guys know that story. And that story actually is about like, in so, in, it's about lots of things. But in some ways, the story emphasizes like the material of the miracle. You know what I mean? That's why you know the story as the story of water into wine. That's like the material, like the stuff of the miracle. Water becomes wine. Water and wine, the material of the miracle. And then if you go to John chapter 4, there's that really beautiful story of Jesus who meets the Samaritan woman at the well. You guys know that story? And he says, hey, can you give me a drink? She's like, you're, I'm a woman, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jewish rabbi, you should not be talking to me. And, uh, you know, like, he says, okay, well, I have to get my own water. And she's like, how are you going to get your own water? You don't have a bucket. And then Jesus says, <laughs> it's like such classic Jesus bomb. He's like, the water I have to give will bring, like, life. You know, he's like, it, like, turns into this beautiful metaphor. And then the woman asks a question. She says, like, how? Like, how? That story is, again, about many things, but that story of water is about not the material of the, of the miracle, but, like, the method. Make sense? The woman asks the question of method. Like, how will you get the water, and how will that water bring eternal life? And so John's been doing this. He's been, like, using water to talk about, like, the material of the miracle, the method of the miracle. But here in this story, it's really beautiful. In this story of the invalid man at the Bethesda pool, it's not about the material of the miracle nor the method of the miracle. It is about the source of the miracle. And this is key for us. As Jesus asks you the question, do you want to get well, this is key. Often, because we vacillate between these two extremes, like I can do it myself, or all hope is lost, nothing will ever change, we lose sight of the fact that healing is beyond us. You cannot heal yourself. Now, physically, maybe. Right? You get a cut, you put some Neosporin and a Band-Aid and you're good to go, whatever. But in the deepest parts of our lives, the deepest parts of our souls, the deepest wounds, the deepest scars, the deepest pain, the deepest grief, you cannot heal yourself. You need another source. What does Jesus say? John 5, 8 and 9. Then Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. Jesus said. Jesus looks at an invalid man who has believed for 38 years that healing is in these waters right next to him. And he's hopeless because he can't help himself. And what does Jesus do here? He doesn't even touch the water. Jesus comes to the man and he just speaks. He says to the man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. 
It's like if I were staring at that claw game with my forehead up against the glass, just hopeless. I'll never get one of those panda bears. And then a man behind me taps me on my shoulder and he says, hey, here you go. And gives me a life-size panda bear to give to my daughter. That's what's happening here. Jesus is essentially saying you are staring at your own reflection in the water, hoping that if you can just get in, and when the waters are stirred at the right time, at the exact moment, you're focused on the material of the miracle, the water, and the method of the miracle, which is to get in first. And Jesus taps this man on the shoulder, and he says it's not the material nor the method that heals you. It is the source of healing. Healing for you is not found in any one particular material nor any specific method. Healing is found in the source of all healing, who is Jesus himself. And he is good. And his goodness is running after you. And he is faster than you. All you got to do is stop for a moment Turn around, stop staring at the stuff you thought would bring you healing, and simply look to Jesus and answer the question as he asks, do you want to get well? Because the answer to that question is not in any particular material or method. It's not in going to the right church or singing the right songs or praying the right prayers. It's not in singing a particular way or worshiping in a particular way or praying in a particular way or reading and studying the scriptures in a particular way. There is no checklist that Jesus presents before you to say, check off all of these two dozen things and then I will heal you. No, Jesus takes those checklists, he rips them apart and he asks you the question, forget all of that. Do you want to get well? And if you do, you simply say yes. You look to Jesus and you say yes. Now Jesus asks the man to participate in the healing too. You notice that? This is not, this is not self-help. Like the man could not on his own get up and walk, could he? He would have. Within those 38 years, if he could have, he would have. But he couldn't. It's Jesus, the source of healing, offering healing, but then the man has to literally step into the healing. Jesus says to the man, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. I mean, can you imagine what is running through this man's mind? He's like, are you, are you serious? I've been laying here for 38 years. But what does the story tell us? At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. What do you need healing from today? What do you need healing from? And do you really want to get well? Maybe it's literally like a physical ailment. It's like a physical thing. Now listen, I'm not here to like preach health and wealth gospel to you. That if you just do X, Y, and Z, then you know that, that pain or whatever will go away. But I will say this to you. One, I do believe in miracles. I've seen them. There's, it's not anything we control. That's manipulation. Um, here's what I will say to you, I, and this is like sidebar tangent. I think in today's Christian culture, we, m- many people long for the gifts of the Spirit much more than they long for the fruit of the Spirit. And I think this is a, so much of what Pastor Kurt has been talking to us about in the evenings. 
so much of healing and the power of the Spirit's gifts in our lives, they are born out of a life of quietly, patiently, secretly, intimately, without fanfare, without applause, cultivating the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. You want to see miracles and healings in your life? Put more energy into becoming the sort of person who exudes love and joy and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of those things. So many of us are like, I want to speak in tongues and I want to heal the you know, arthritis, and I want to lay hands and make the lame walk and the blind see, and I believe that still happens. But when that becomes the focus at the compromise of not living and leaning into the fruit of the Spirit, it becomes manipulation, it becomes dangerous, it becomes about self. So where do you need healing? Maybe you need a miracle. I believe, again, miracles are possible. But they are possible as the Spirit of God does His work in us. Or maybe you need healing in your marriage today. Maybe you need healing with your kids or your grandkids. Maybe you need healing in some situation with work or your finances. Maybe there needs to be healing in your church. These last two years have just torn it apart. Maybe you need healing for some inner turmoil that is just wrecking you inside. And I just want to tell you, you can't do it on your own. But it is not hopeless. Healing is possible and it is accessible in Jesus, the source of healing. Look to him as the source and participate with him as he takes you through the journey of healing. I'm going to show you a, a picture of um, Bach, Johann Sebast Sebastian Bach. You guys know Bach as one of the greatest composers of all time. And he's actually really famous for, um, at the end of his compositions, he would always sign his compositions on the bottom with the letters SDG. The letters SDG stand for Soli Deo Gloria, which is Latin for God's glory alone. And Bach is really famous for this, like these beautiful, epic, timeless masterpieces he would compose at the end of the original sheet music that he composed himself, that he wrote on, penned himself. At the bottom, almost all of them say SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, for God's glory alone. He's really famous for that. What is lesser known, though, I'll show you a picture of it here is at the top of most of his compositions, if you look on the upper left-hand corner, I don't know if you can make it out, the very upper left-hand corner are the letters JJ. You see that? JJ. JJ stands for Yuva Yesu. You know what that means in Latin? Help, Jesus. Before Bach, would ever write a single note, literally, before a single note, you know what he would do? He would go to the source and he would say to him, Jesus, help. This is why at the end of penning these masterpieces, what would he say? For God's glory alone. Asking Jesus to be the source of our healing is, in my opinion, the best way to live the sort of life that is truly worshipful. Because at the end of it, you've come to realize with clarity, oh, this is nothing I could have done on my own. All that self-help stuff is a lie. Now, yes, I participate. It's not like I sit back, recline in my chair, and God does all, this, all the work. No, I, I have to pick up my mat, and I have to get up and walk. But the source of the strength, the healing that enables me to do so is Jesus himself. 
Bach once said this, I play the notes as they are written, but it is God who makes the music. You need healing in your life. You want your life to play a song that is more beautiful than the one being played now? Begin with those words. Jesus, help. Remember that it is not hopeless, but you cannot do it on your own. That Jesus is the source of your healing. Let's pray together. Jesus, help. Help us. Help us in our need, in our brokenness, in our sickness, in our weariness, in our shame, in our guilt, in our pain, in our loss, in our grief, in our mourning, in our confusion, our anxiety, our fear, our uncertainty. Help. Thank you for running after us, for being faster than us and for being able and willing, and for not leaving us to fend for ourselves. We love you. We thank you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.